Sounds True presents Music as Medicine, Session 7, Rhythm as Pulse, with Kay Gardner. We humans are very rhythmic animals. Whenever we hear the beat of music, our toes start tapping, we start swaying in rhythm with the beat, we're not even conscious of it. It's just very, very natural. You can see it with small children, babies even, standing in the crib, holding on to the side, and if there's music playing, the baby bouncing up and down in time to the rhythm. A while back, I used to play regularly in a nursing home. I take my flute there once a week and wander the halls playing kind of Irish jig music or up music for the patients there. And there was an elderly woman. She must have been in her late 80s. Her name was Sophie. And I remember seeing her walking down the hall using two canes. She had Alzheimer's, advanced Alzheimer's. And she couldn't communicate at all. And she'd walk down the hall with the two canes in a very hunched, slow way of walking, no light in her eyes at all. The minute I started playing an up-tempo piece on my flute, a jig, up went the canes. The light came into her eyes. She started dancing. And as long as the flute music was playing, she was dancing in rhythm with the music. And she looked vibrant and alive. As soon as the music stopped playing, she went back to her hunched, two cane, no light in the eyes demeanor. That meant a lot to me. It showed me that music has the power of touching people immediately. And dance music, music with a beat, tends to touch people immediately. They start moving to it. It's almost as if we don't have any control over it. We move to whatever rhythmic stimulus is given us. Now, if you notice how flocks of birds or schools of fish all seem to move together. They're leaderless, but yet they're moving together. They kind of lock in with the same rhythm and the same energy. This is called entrainment. When animals or people start locking in and beating in sync, moving in sync, You'll hear a lot of this word entrainment as we talk about music's rhythm. And in healing music, the function of rhythm is to duplicate the healthy pulse. The function of rhythm in healing music is to duplicate the healthy pulse. And it all comes back to this word again, entrainment. There's a phenomenon when there's a room full of clocks and they're ticking at different rates. If given enough time, the clocks that are closest to each other will start locking in and ticking together, even if they've started ticking at different rates. The scientific name for this is mutual phase locking of two oscillators. Another word for it is entrainment. Biologists, when looking through the microscope at two heart cells beating, live heart cells beating. If each is beating in its own time, as they get closer to each other, they lock in and begin beating in sync with each other. Again, this is entrainment. So this happens in us when we hear music, why we start beating in sync with it. Because we are naturally rhythmic animals, we respond to whatever rhythmic stimulus is present in our environment, whether we're conscious of it or not. A Bulgarian psychiatrist, Georgi Lazanov, found that if he played Baroque music, that's music written around the 1700s, the time of Bach, the time of Vivaldi, Telemann, Handel, if music from this period was played and students would breathe in rhythm with the beat of the music, he proved that they were able to learn a subject much faster. We called it super learning. 
So here again, the entrainment enabled people to learn faster by locking in with the rhythmic stimulus. Now the most obvious pulses that we can duplicate musically are three particular pulses that we have in our body, or three particular rhythmic cycles that appear in the human organism. The first is the heartbeat. That's the most obvious one. The second rhythm is the breath cycle. And the third rhythm that we use is rhythm that duplicates the brain waves. The most basic musical beat that duplicates the body's pulse is the heartbeat. And in every aboriginal culture, the rhythm of the heartbeat is the basis. A rhythm like this. The lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub of the heartbeat. In Native American practice, the beat of the drum echoes the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And we entrain with the heartbeat of Mother Earth when we hear the drum, when the Native drum leads us into dancing. Every other culture also has this basic heartbeat in their Aboriginal peoples, music. So in music, we want to duplicate the beat of the healthy heart. And the beat of the healthy heart can fall between 50 and 80 beats per minute. 50 for someone who's really in shape, who's perhaps a runner, a super athlete, to the rest of us who probably have heartbeats somewhere between 68 and 82, thereabouts. So I can actually write music that has that heartbeat in it. In fact, I usually put it in the kettle drums. I'll put the heartbeat in and I'll hire someone to play the kettle drums and the woman who usually plays kettle drums for me says, oh no, it's a K Gardner piece. I know it's gotta be a K Gardner piece. All I get to do is love dub, love dub, love dub. Well, if a piece of music has a really strong beat to it, we're going to entrain to it. And if we're writing music or creating music or choosing music that we want to help us regulate the heart, then we're wanting music that has a good, healthy heartbeat in it. So yes, when I'm writing healing music, I'm going to write a heartbeat for the timpani. Here's a heartbeat exercise. Perhaps you can pretend that you are a heart. So if you say lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, over and over again in a good steady rhythm, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, keep it going, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, keep it going. Love dub, love dub. Now, were you able to keep that love dub going when I put that other rhythm in? Were you good and steady with it? Most groups that I do this with, and I have them doing the love dub, love dub, and then I play this other rhythm, they totally lose the beat. They want to go into the rhythm that I'm playing. If you kept a beat with it, then you're a good percussionist. But for the most part, people get confused, their bodies get confused, they want to go into the emphasis of the beat. And that can't be healthy. Because the beat that I played against the heart is literally against the heart. And it's found in a lot of popular music. And what happens is the body gets weak when it hears too much of that beat. That's called the anapestic beat, and that is a term from Greek poetry, a type of meter, short, short, long, short, short, long, where the heart is short, long, short, long, lub dub. Dr. John Diamond, in his book Your Body Doesn't Lie, talks about 
an exercise called applied kinesiology. It's a type of muscle testing where you hold your arm out to your side straight and someone comes along and presses on your forearm while you're resisting that pressure. If you're in a healthy situation, then you are able to resist the pressure and push against the hand that is pushing your arm down. If you are engaging in something that is not healthy for you, your muscle loses tone. Set of earphones on listeners, and he played music with the healthy heartbeat in it. Participants were easily able to resist the pressure on the forearm. However, when he played the anapestic beat, they immediately lost strength. The arm went down. And he concluded from this exercise that the anapestic beat was not a particularly healthy beat. It certainly isn't a beat that goes along with heartbeat. So this is not a beat that I would use if I had an irregular heartbeat. It is not a beat that I would expose myself to if I were trying to regulate my heart. I would want to expose myself to music that had the healthy heartbeat built right into it. There are several world rhythms that duplicate the healthy heartbeat. One is the Spanish habanera, and you will recognize this beat in the example that I'm going to play for you now, which is from my large work for the chakras, A Rainbow Path. This particular movement is for the heart. It's called the Greenwood, and you'll notice that the timpani and the bass fiddle are the heartbeat throughout. We'll play a short segment of it. Note also that each of these pieces from Rainbow Path starts with a drone sound, and the drone continues under everything. But in this particular one, our major focus is on the heartbeat rhythm, the Spanish tango, or habanera. might recognize this rhythm from the opera Carmen. It's very familiar to us. But this is a rhythm that duplicates the healthy heart, and I used it at 60 beats or 60 cycles per minute. Now, for a faster heartbeat, you might want to go to the Caribbean. A lot of the rhythms of the Caribbean are in the heartbeat, and these rhythms have come to us from Africa, where there are many, many rhythms that duplicate the heartbeat. The rhythm from South America that I am particularly fond of, which is a very fast heartbeat, is the samba. In the samba example that you're about to hear, you will hear the bass drum as the heartbeat. Later, some other percussion will join it, but the basic beat, boom, ba-boom, boom, ba-boom, boom, ba-boom, boom, ba-boom, is the heartbeat, and that's the basic samba rhythm. This is the beat of the heart when a person is dancing. The next rhythm in our 
bodies that we can duplicate musically, although not as easily, is the breath cycle. We have 14 to 16 cycles of breath per minute. In other words, we inhale and exhale about 14 to 16 times per minute. But it isn't a regular beat like the heartbeat. It's in four. One, two, three, four. One, two, one, ba-boom, one, ba-boom, one, ba-boom, etc. But with the breath cycle, it is not a regular beat. Now, someone once said, well, the breath cycle is in three. So I thought, oh, then it must be in waltz time. But no, it is not a regular 3-4 beat at all. It's an asymmetrical beat. Kurt Sachs, in his book Rhythm and Tempo, writes about Asian music. Asian music has no harmony. What harmony means to the West, the almost breath-like change from tension to relaxation, is in the East provided by rhythm. In avoiding the deadly inertia of evenness, rhythm helps an otherwise autonomous melody to breathe in and out, just as harmony does in the West. In other words, the rhythms of the East, especially of the Balkan music, are asymmetrical, meaning that there's an inhalation, an exhalation, and then a still point. And the still point varies. If you've been exercising, you've been running for a long time, the still point between your inhalation and your exhalation is very, very short. If you're in coma, on the other hand, or close to death, the still point is very, very long. So there's an almost evenness of inhalation and exhalation, but the still point is the variable here. So musically, it's very difficult to duplicate a breathing cycle that's going to apply to everyone who's listening because every single person, depending on their activity and their heart rate and their health, is going to have a different breath cycle. But I did want to point it out that there is such a thing as the rhythm of the breath. And this asymmetrical feeling happens the most in music from, as I said, from the Balkan area. But I can give you an example of music. So it's not music that's in three, four, like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's not music that's in four, four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Instead, you'll get music in a five beats or seven beats. Here's an example in seven. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, short, short, long, short, short, long, short, short, long. One, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three. Or seven beats to the measure. These asymmetrical rhythms duplicate the breath in that the part of the beat is equal, duplicating the inhalation and the exhalation, and part of the beat is longer or shorter, duplicating the still point between inhalation and exhalation. So if you were creating a piece of music for someone who had a specific condition, you would have to go to that person and create a piece of music that duplicated their breathing at that point. A lot of music practitioners who are creating music at the bedsides of people in hospital or hospice are trained in this very thing, to become one with the breath of the person whom they're playing for, to create music that is of their breathing pattern, is personally designed for them. And this is called the ISO principle, for one thing, ISO in Greek meaning equal. In other words, in training with the person or persons that you're working with. Always start with where they are and then move them to the desired place. So perhaps say if their heartbeat was irregular or their breath cycle was irregular then you would start with 
your beat duplicating where they were, even if it was unhealthy, and then slowly move to the desired healthy rate. First of all, this is just giving respect to the person you're working with. This is not imposing your ego on that person's process. You might take a small drum, and you don't need that. You could just use the top of the table or the dashboard if you're in the car. And you could just beat on it, noticing what your breath cycle is, and set up your own rhythm. What is your breath cycle right now? If you're under stress, beat that out. How long is your inhalation? How long is your exhalation? How long is the still point? And beat that. In this way, you'll learn to recognize what your breathing cycles are, what your breathing rhythms are, and you'll be able to choose music that either duplicates that, and I would recommend this Eastern European music because it's very good for these breathing rhythms, or it just might be a point of interest for you because I think it's very interesting to know that we do have these cycles in our bodies. When people go to the bedside of people who are ill and play music, they will notice that there are medical machines that are measuring the heartbeat, medical machines that are also measuring the breath cycle. To me, it'll be fascinating in the future to be able to interface synthesizers with the medical machines and be able to create music exactly for patients by having the synthesized music duplicate what the medical machines are doing. In fact, the medical machines might be able to interface with the synthesizers and create music right there on the spot. The third bodily rhythm that we can duplicate is the rhythm of the brain waves. And there's been a lot of research done on this recently. Brain waves are much faster than the cycles of the breath, much faster than the cycle of the heartbeat. When we are wide awake and questioning in a skeptical frame of mind, we are in what is called the beta state. The brain is pulsing at about 13 to 21 cycles per second. In alpha state, we may still be awake, but we're kind of floating. We're not questioning. Our eyes may be open, they may be shut, but we are awake. And this state is between 7 and 13 cycles per second. The theta state is the state that we're in either in deep meditation or the state that we're in when we're just about to fall asleep or just about to wake up in the morning. You know how sometimes creative ideas come to you when you're just about to wake up in the morning or just about to go to sleep at night? That cycle is about anywhere between three and eight cycles per second. The delta state of brainwave activity is between one and three cycles per second. This is happening when we're asleep or in coma. Our brains are continuously beating at all those different pulses, but there usually is one dominant pulse. And usually, one side of the brain is more dominant than the other side of the brain. When in deep meditation, both hemispheres of the brain are entrained. They're working together, and they're beating at 7.8 cycles per second. Because most people are only thinking with half a brain at one time, there have been experiments to try to get both sides of the brain beating in sync. There's a term for this, and it's called frequency following response. It's like a crystal goblet resonating to a pure tone. The brain responds to an audio signal by reproducing it, by becoming synchronized. In other words, and training with it. There's a lot of other earthly phenomenon that beat at this particular cycle. One is the Schumann resonance, which is the vibration or energy that goes around the equator, that swirls around the equator. And that also swirls at 7.8 cycles per second. Valerie Hunt, a physicist, has taken a frequency response machine to some of the sacred sites around the world, including Delphi, the pyramids, and others, and has found that they too beat at 7.8 cycles per second. This is a rhythm that is right between theta and alpha. A few years ago, 
I was lucky enough to experience a machine called the Genesis II. And it was a kind of like a geodesic dome from which was hung a massage table. And there were speakers hung from four points at the top of the dome. In the massage table, there are sensors, electronic sensors, that pick up the pulses of my body. Outside the dome is an operator. And in my case, it was a registered nurse. And she was watching these uh, graphs and panels on her machine that showed the energy of both sides of my spine. It showed my blood rhythm that showed my breath rhythm, that showed my brain activities. And their study was playing music through the speakers and through the table to see what response the listener would have. And so I was listening to the music, and I wasn't able to relax because I was too curious about the operator and what she was watching. But I did watch for some time, and I could actually see how the music affected me. At a certain point while the music was playing, the operator asked me if she could climb up into this dome with me and give me a massage. And I was fascinated to see how after the massage, everything slowed down, I was much more relaxed, everything was more even. It was quite an advanced biofeedback machine. And I found it fascinating that all of the rhythms of my body could be tracked in one experience. Also, I found that the music changed. They had built into this machine a way that the pulses of the listener were engaged in the actual perception of how the music sounded. This was a machine that just brought home to me the extreme power of music on the pulses of the human body and how entrainment and states of relaxation and states of anxiety can have a lot to do with how the pulses are acting, that we can change the activity of the pulses through relaxation and through activity. I have a set of Tibetan temple bells. They're also called tingshas. And one is a little sharper than an E on the piano. And one is a little flatter than an E on the piano. And when I play them at the same time, a really interesting phenomenon happens. Can you hear that wow, 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 wow sound? These pulsations are called beats. They occur when two sounds of slightly different frequencies occur at the same time. Now, if I used two tuning forks, one tuned at 440 cycles per second, which is the note that orchestras tune to, A440, and say the other one was at the frequency of 444, the same phenomenon would happen. The difference between the two frequencies would be four cycles per second. This wah-wah-wah beat pattern would entrain with a slow theta because the brain beats in the pattern that is between the two frequencies that it hears. So if one ear is hearing A440 and the other is hearing A444, the difference is four, the brain starts to entrain to four cycles per second. And this is a very magical thing. I noticed this was happening with the instruments in Bali when I traveled with Don Campbell to Bali in 1989. We went to a town where they built the instruments of the gamelan orchestra. A gamelan orchestra is an orchestra predominantly of percussion instruments. There's hardly anything but percussion instruments in a gamelan orchestra. And there were about 30 different players. 
and they play gongs and metallophones, kind of like vibraphones or xylophones. Metallophones of varying sizes and other strange percussion instruments that we're not used to here in the West. And I noticed that they built the instruments in pairs so that one jublog, which is a metallophone, and the other jublog were identical except that they were slightly off pitch from each other so that a swirling energy happened when they were playing the same thing, the same thing that happened with these Tibetan bells of mine. And there's a magical trance-like state that one gets into when listening to Balinese music, to the music of the gamelan. My feeling is that we are hearing the difference tone between the two pairs of instruments, and our brains are entraining into a very, very slow state. In Bali, there's a dance called the Chris Dance, and it's a dance where the participants stab themselves all the way through their cheeks and their bodies with these very sharp objects. They're in a trance state when they go into it, and I'm convinced that the music helps them access that trance state because they are pulsing at two slightly different beats per second, and the brain is making up the difference and moving into that altered state. There are machines now that work to get both sides of the brain, both hemispheres, working in sync, and they use this technique. Because you're wearing earphones when you're listening to these tapes, and one side of your head, or one ear, is hearing one frequency, the other ear is hearing a frequency which is slightly off from the first one, but gets you into theta, gets you into a deep meditation state, supposedly faster than meditation without these devices. These can be very useful for slowing people down, getting them into a very relaxed state, and going extremely deep, where a lot of creative thoughts come in that state. When one is in theta, it is an extremely creative place, and therefore one can access that creativity by using some of these hemi-sync devices. Don Campbell, who's a composer, a colleague of mine, has studied a lot about how music affects the brain. And there's a particular piece of music of his that I found very useful when I was dealing with my father, who was in the last stages of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. One morning, my mom went off to church. It was a Sunday. And I stayed home to be with Dad. Now, at this point in Dad's life, he was having hallucinations. He wasn't lucid for more than three seconds at a time. He was pretty much out of it. He would be flicking ashes of a non-existent cigarette. He was not in a good state. I put on Don Campbell's Crystal Meditations, which I'll play for you shortly. And in this composition, the piano is beating at alpha, and the synthesizer is pulsing at theta. And somehow, my father began in training with the beats that the music was presenting. And I was able to talk with him for 20 minutes. This was such a gift because, as I said, he was not lucid for more than seconds at a time. We were able to talk about his illness. Yes, he did realize he was ill. I asked him if he was afraid to die. He was not afraid to die. I asked him if he had any regrets, and he told me the only ones he had were that he would not see his grandchildren grow to adulthood. But he was ready to die, and what a gift this was to me to be able to have an actual conversation with Dad, even though he was in this state, this advanced Alzheimer's state. It took about five minutes for him to start to entrain with the music. We were able to communicate I think his brain, entrained with a stereo pulsing of the music, the alpha rhythm relaxed him. The theta pulse enabled him to go deep into an internalized place where he could be in touch with his intuitive processes. He was able to respond while in a state different from his normal beta and dysfunctional state. I can't conclude from this that Don Campbell's piece would work for everybody because it was a one-time experience. 
but the dramatic effects on my father pointed me in the direction of researching how to musically duplicate brain waves. So now listen to a bit of this piece, Crystal Meditations, by Don Campbell. So with the use of computer-generated sound in synthesizers, we have a great tool. It's not difficult to program pulses onto these machines and to have them as inherent parts of our compositions. Can you hear the difference between these two tones on my flute? I'm going to play the same note, but there's going to be something different about each one. The first one had what I would call a straight tone. No fluctuations, just a straight tone. The second one I added vibrato. Everyone who sings or plays a wind instrument has vibrato. Mine is quite slow. In fact, if you looked at your second hand and measured where my vibrato fell, you would find that it fell in the theta range. When I was auditioning to be a master's degree candidate in flute performance, I was told that my vibrato was too slow. But I find it very interesting now that I'm doing this work of relaxation and healing music that the flute vibrato is an asset to me because it is so slow. It is very hard to teach vibrato. For the most part, vibrato is a natural occurrence happening after puberty. It's the difference between hearing a boy's soprano and an adult woman's soprano. A boy soprano has a very pure voice with no vibrato, but after reaching puberty, the vibrato occurs. In violins or string instruments, you can see the hand moving, and that creates a vibrato. So what you can do with vibrato is actually duplicate the brainwave cycles. I find certain instruments are very good for this. One is another metallophone, the vibraphone. Picture this instrument. It's like a xylophone. It has metal bars that are played with mallets. But under each metal bar is a long tube, and that's the resonating tube. Within that long tube is a disc that whirls around and stops the air, therefore creating a vibrato. And the player of the vibraphone can regulate the speed of the vibrato with just a little switch. So when I'm writing a piece of music where I want the brain to move into a slow alpha or theta state, I'll use a vibraphone set to a very slow pulse. Here's an example. You heard women's voices, you heard flute, but you also heard a pulsation that was set up by the vibraphone, and that was set to the theta range. So this piece was from Rainbow Path, which was a piece written for the chakras, and this particular piece was for the crown, for the chakra of bliss, the feeling of oneness with all that is, the feeling that we have when we're in deep theta. Several years ago, I was invited to the Yale medical school and the New Haven Hospital by the nurse anesthetists 
who were about to start a program of relaxant hypnotic music that they would play for their patients during surgery. Whether they were using local anesthesia, in other words, being awake for the process, or general anesthesia, being put to sleep. The anesthetists and anesthesiologists were very interested in how music could help them because the most dangerous part of surgery is the anesthesia. It's very hard to know how each person is going to react to it. And they thought that if music could help them get a person into an anesthetic state, what does anesthesia mean but without feeling, move the listener into almost a trance state that they wouldn't have to use so much anesthesia and therefore the surgical procedure would be much safer. In my own surgery, my own experience of surgery, I created music that beat at about 60 cycles per second that would go with my heartbeat and that also would engage or entrain with my brain rhythms when I was in a deep theta state, which is the state one is in when one is under anesthesia. I highly recommend finding music that beats with the pulses when you're going through surgery, whether it's dental surgery or it could be with a surgeon. The music that is found to be best for this is music that beats at about 60 beats per minute, just as the heartbeat does. And you can find this most in slow movements from the Baroque period. If you're a classical music lover, this is not difficult to find. You find music by Bach or Paco Bell, whom we heard earlier, or Telemann, or Handel, or Vivaldi, and you take the slow movements, and these beat at about 60 beats per minute. There's a whole series put out by the Lind Institute, L-I-N-D, the Lind Institute, of pieces of music in that beat pattern, 60 beats per minute or so. And they come under the name of Largo, or Adagio, and those are just the names of the slow movements. And they're from very fine orchestras from around the world. So these are pieces of music I recommend taking into surgery with you or taking into the dentist's office with you. They'll calm you down. You will start to entrain with the beat of the music, and they will make the whole procedure a lot easier on you. So remember that in healing music, the function of rhythm is to duplicate the healthy pulses of the body. Just as there are many chanting groups and choirs that we can join to use our voices, we can also join drumming groups. Many are available these days. You'll find workshops where you can even build drums, and you may apply these principles that we've learned to your drumming groups and to your own personal drumming. <laughs> This concludes Session 7. Please turn the tape over for Session 8.